Welcome to Watch Mojo, and today we're exploring all the precise moments that forever altered entertainment history. And we're starting with the exact moments that ruined movie franchises. Think four weddings and a funeral. She wasn't in four weddings and a funeral. I, I wasn't in four weddings and a funeral. Just protect your fake baby. Welcome to Watch Mojo, and today we're counting down our picks for the top 10 exact moments that killed movie franchises. You're the greatest. See you, sport. See you. For this list, we'll be looking at the scenes that single-handedly ruined an entire film series. At what point did you totally clock out of these franchises? Number 10. Velociraptor in First Class, Jurassic Park 3. In their third stint of prehistoric mayhem, this series was clearly struggling to maintain the novelty of dinosaurs. Their sheer wonder, terror, and coolness fossilized more with each installment, especially in regard to Velociraptors. It's just the two raptors, right? You sure the third one's contained? Yes. Unless they figure out how to open doors. They're the center of some of the series' most iconic moments, but also the most infamous. In a dream sequence, Dr. Allen imagines one of the dinos calling him by name. Allen. Yeah, it's weird. But even if it didn't feel totally out of place, it still completely robs the creatures of their remaining menace. At this point, it was obvious that the threat of dinosaurs had gone extinct. Wake up. I'm almost there. Number 9. Julia Roberts as Julia Roberts. Ocean's 12. Moment. Small role. Who am I supposed to be? Well, most stories require some suspension of disbelief, but these dozen criminals made a name through inventive and grounded thrills. The fun of the heist was discovering how the characters would believably weasel out of tense situations. So, it completely shattered the film's reality when Julia Roberts' character, Tess, goes undercover as the actress Julia Roberts. Oh, no, we understand no. you're feeling a little insecure. That is totally natural. No, that's good, actually. Because you're playing an actress. They're all insecure. No, you I'm can not use insecure. That. I'm freaking out. Yes, that's brilliant. That's right. The gag might have worked in a meta comedy, but in the middle of a nail biting thriller, it's anything but funny. At least, not in the way it was intended. Roberts elevates the material where she can, but not even her committed performance could salvage the series' tone. No, it's um, Julia. She's Who's this? Uh, it's, 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 it's Julia. I'm with Bruce Willis. You're with Bruce right now. Number eight, the architect's flawed design. The Matrix Reloaded. Hello, Neil. Who are you? I am the architect. I created the Matrix. I've been waiting for you. This twist is a blatant misunderstanding of the original Matrix's success. That film worked in part because it didn't try to answer its own questions. It trusted the audience to form their own interpretation, which is why the architect's appearance in the second movie feels like a betrayal. At a basic level, his last minute debut reeks of bad story structure, but it especially stings since he brings a ton of confusing exposition with him. You haven't answered my question. Quite right. In trying to answer things that weren't meant to be, the slick pace of the franchise was bogged down with needless lore and muddied moral discussions. The series should have taken a cue from Neo and slowed way down. If I were you, I would hope that we don't meet again. We won't. Number 7. Pauly's Robot, Rocky IV. What the hell is this? Your present! Yo, I wanted a sports car for my birthday. Not no walking trash can. The Balboa boxer's time in the ring drew critical acclaim, an iconic legacy, and heaps at the box office. But despite all that, the fourth film managed to get KO'd in record fashion, at least in regard to Polly. He spends most of the runtime saddled in a chair next to his robot companion. If that weren't bad enough, there's some bizarre romantic subtext that's better left powered off. 
What's that? That's my girl. The previous movies could have their cheesy moments, but this marked shift in tone was downright laughable, and not in a good way. The scenes were even removed from the director's cut, which should tell you everything you need to know. Go on, make a wish, like he says. I wish I wasn't in this nightmare. A very classy wish, very nice. What do you think? Number six, Harry Hart who? Kingsman, The Golden Circle. Eggie, wherever the Harry was that you knew, he's gone, I'm afraid. Goodbye. Colin Firth's turn as the self-serious spy, Galahad, delivered some of the coolest moments in spy movies, period. Though he met an unceremonious end in the first film, we could forgive the script gymnastics needed to bring him back if it meant we got more Harry Hart. Except we didn't get that. I'm a lepidopterist. You're a what? I study butterflies. You wanted to be before you joined the army, but... He spends the first half of the sequel with amnesia, which turns him into a waste of screen time with none of the edge, wit, or cool action sequences that made him popular in the first place. Even once he's regained his memories, he's still a disappointing, lamer husk of his former self, which, honestly, is a good way to describe the sequel overall. Just know that having something to lose what makes life worth living. Number five, Jack steers the franchise, Pirates of the Caribbean on Stranger Tides. Apparently, Disney's never heard of the saying, too much of a good thing. All part of the plan, yes? No. A little bit of Jack Sparrow went a long way in the original Pirates trilogy, especially since he was one ingredient of a much larger recipe. But without the likes of Will or Elizabeth to ground his eccentricity, this standalone sequel sailed into the choppy waters of self-parody. I am with child. Yours. I don't recall that we ever had- You were drunk! I've actually never been that drunk. Within the opening minutes, it's painfully obvious that Jack's stick was not enough to keep the franchise afloat on its own. To be fair, a captain is supposed to go down with their ship, but usually they aren't the ones sinking it in the first place. Yes, now you will survive. Number four. Grindelwald and where not to use him, Fantastic Beasts and where to find them. This second trek through the Wizarding World started out with a lumos of promise. The thought of Newt Scamander exploring the world's unique critters seemed primed for success, especially against an unforgettably menacing Colin Farrell as Percival Graves. Well done. Good job, Lisa. It's only a boggart. The catch? He was actually the legendary fugitive, Grindelwald, in disguise. This third act twist meant the story wasn't about exploration, the greater world, or even Newt at all anymore. They have killed. Many of my fun. The threat of Grindelwald bought up every bit of storytelling real estate and set up a painfully generic good versus evil plot. To boot, the two sequels that focus on him both made less at the box office than their predecessor. These kinds of numbers speak for themselves. The crime of seeking the truth. Number three, Sayonara, Newton Hicks, Alien 3. Where are the others? They didn't make it. What? They didn't survive. It's a good thing no one can hear our screams in space since that's all this movie makes us want to do. Admittedly, not many sequels outdo the original, but this one actively erases the goodwill of what came before. Alien spent a good chunk of its story developing a genuine camaraderie between Ellen, Newt, and Hicks. So, when the third film opens by unceremoniously offing two-thirds of that dynamic, it felt like the series was jettisoning its past. And the girl. She drowned in her cryotube. I don't think she was conscious. 
Worse, it left the impression that the franchise was prioritizing shock value over character development. That kind of shift never ends well. Forgive me. Number 2. Emergency Landing Live Free or Die Hard. What are you gonna do? Let's go pick up a kid out of Jersey! Drive him down to DC! Hard empty, huh? Instead of jumping the shark, John McClane jumped the helicopter, and the result was calling Mayday on the series' prospects. The gritty tale of a normal guy thrown into a less than normal situation always worked because it was about tight hallways, family, and a deadly game of cat and mouse. But by trying to constantly top itself, the sequels delivered a mess of empty action scenes and eye-rolling CGI explosions. But nothing may ever get quite as silly as a car smashing into a helicopter. Hey, at least it went out with a literal bang. Ironically, this film totally lived up to its title, just not the live free part. Was, she just killed a helicopter with a car. I was out of bullets. Number 1. A Dance to Remember Spider-Man 3 Sam Raimi's original Spidey trilogy is heralded to this day due to its grounded and earnest portrayal of the Web Slinger. Or at least that was the case until Spider-Man 3. This series killer delivered a dance montage so cringy that it's nearly painful to watch. It hurts all the more since this was their attempt at the iconic Venom storyline. No wonder we never got Raimi's Spider-Man 4. In a way, the scene is a microcosm for everything wrong with the film. It's out of character, overly comical, and just downright bizarre. At least Peter danced like nobody was watching, because at that point, everyone wished they weren't. Well, as it turns out, TV shows are not immune to the ruthless hand of fate. So here now are all the exact moments that ruined once promising TV shows. That's it. That's it. Welcome to Watch Mojo, and today we're counting down our picks for the most egregious moments from TV shows that ruined their reputations or marked their declines in quality. Number 30, April Nardini, Gilmore Girls. This classic comedy drama had a pretty solid run. It would have been darn near perfect if it wasn't for the introduction of Luke's long-lost daughter, April. I'm sorry, did you say your father? Yes, these science fairs have gotten so political lately. Storylines like long-lost kids are usually heralds for disaster, and that is certainly the case here. Not only was April herself pretty bland, maybe even a little irritating at times, but she introduced an absurd element of soap opera into an otherwise cozy show. Did your mom explain that this isn't necessarily a one-time thing? I was thinking maybe we could make it semi-regular or even just, you know, regular? Uh, okay. Good. She completely upended the status quo and seemed like nothing but a plot device to stir things up. Drama for the sake of drama, in other words. April didn't fit, and she kind of ruined everything. Number 29, Agrestic Burns Down, Weeds. Sort of a funnier Breaking Bad, Weeds chronicles the illegal activities of Nancy Botwin, a typical suburban soccer mom who turns to weed dealing after her husband dies. Give me a little respect. I'm the biggest game in the private community of Agrestic. Drugs sell themselves, biscuit. You ain't sh the show was a critical success for its first three seasons, when the town of Agrestic was still, you know, a town. In the third season finale, Nancy burns her house down to destroy incriminating evidence while the rest of Majestic faces wildfire. Removing the primary setting and starting anew elsewhere was certainly a bold creative decision, but it was a huge swing and a miss. 
few liked the new setting and the removal of the unique concept of a drug-dealing soccer mom, so the show's reputation went up in smoke. Number 28. The Musical Episode – Grey's Anatomy We don't know why TV shows keep going to the musical episode well. They almost never work. They're often an odd standout at best and a show-ruining debacle at worst. Unfortunately, Grey's Anatomy belongs in the latter category. Life's like an hourglass glued to the table. No one can find the rewind button now. The medical drama was going quite swimmingly until season 7, when Shonda Rhimes penned the wildly divisive song Beneath the Song. The show's first musical episode, yes, first, it received some harsh reactions from both longtime fans and critics. <laughs> Many things, from the choice of songs to the subpar singing and bizarre tone, were criticized. For many, including lead actor Patrick Dempsey, the idea of doing a musical was, quote, a big mistake. Number 27. Elsa – Once Upon a Time A sarcastic, oh look, it's Elsa, what a surprise, appeared to be the main audience reaction of the Frozen star appearing in ABC's Once Upon a Time because it was a twist that pretty much everyone saw coming from a mile away. Considering the wild, pop-culture-shattering success of Frozen, it was only a matter of time before Elsa intruded upon the world of Once Upon a Time. But her inclusion didn't feel warranted, as a Disney princess from 2013 did not really fit with the show's fairy tale Once Upon a Time theme. Some saw introducing the most popular character in entertainment for the sake of hype and ratings as a desperate attempt at relevancy. I have a surprise for you. Really? Because surprises tend to be hit or miss in this family. This one you'll like, I promise. And finally, fans were split on the resulting Frozen arc, with many voicing their displeasure at its various plot elements. Number 26. The Disaster Episodes – Desperate Housewives A fun satire on suburbia, Desperate Housewives was an enormous success, winning many accolades and becoming a ratings juggernaut for ABC. Carolyn Bigsby had planned on it being an ordinary day. You come out of there, damn it! But as every housewife knows, Damn, nobody goes anywhere. Plans change. The show always towed a tricky tonal line, often veering between tantalizing mystery, absorbing drama, and scathing satire. So few knew what to do with the show's famous disaster episodes. An annual tradition between the third and seventh seasons, these episodes saw the characters of Wisteria Lane living through some type of dramatic occurrence that would inevitably kill off an antagonist. For many, these episodes were just too campy and only served to lazily eliminate a problem. Number 25. Jack's Family – 24 For five seasons, one could make the argument that 24 was the best show on TV. It was probably the most exciting, with thrilling storylines, a unique time-based concept, and some brutally gritty drama. I can't even begin to imagine what you went through over there, Jack. But there's a reason you're here now. And then season six happened. The main problem with this batch of episodes is the inclusion of Jack's father and brother, who are revealed to be terrorists working with Charles Logan. By making the antagonistic threats a part of Jack's family, the show veered way too far into soap opera territory, and many complained that the storyline was ridiculously contrived. There are four more bombs out there. This isn't a joke, Gray. Tell me now, how do I find McCarthy? The nuclear bomb and its mind-boggling lack of repercussions certainly didn't help. Number 24. William's Parentage – The X-Files had this classic paranormal thriller already jumped the shark before its divisive revival? Maybe. The conspiracy storyline was a hot mess that didn't go anywhere, and Mulder's absence in the 8th and 9th seasons was painfully felt. But the shark was officially jumped with My Struggle 3, which opened the 11th and final season. Dana and I have a history, a very important history that goes back 17 years. Here, it's revealed that William is not actually the child of Mulder and Scully. The cigarette-smoking man admits that he secretly impregnated Scully with alien DNA, making Will some kind of hybrid with superpowers. Mulder's not the father. I'm asking, who's the father? 
I am. William is my son. Even by X-File standards, this is silly, not to mention a complete slap in the face for the Mulder Scully shippers. Number 23, House and Cuddy Kiss. House. It's pretty much a rule that the longer a show goes on, the more likely it is that the main characters will hook up. Yes, even if they had seemingly few serious romantic feelings towards each other. Case in point, House and Cuddy. The two first lock lips in the fifth season episode Joy, as House tenderly consoles Cuddy after her adoption falls through. Thus began a wildly unnecessary romance that filled the otherwise cold and gritty drama with a derivative will-they-won't-they -they subplot. It also ruined the character of Dr. House. Suddenly, he was Mr. Romantic, caring less about his patient's health and giving cheesy speeches about love. Words don't matter. Actions matter. You're really gonna take a stand here? You can't say nope. it? Nope. Why? Because I forgot to grab V. With that kiss, House lost its identity and became just another ho-hum medical drama. Number 22, Not Vaughn, Alias. Created by the legendary J.J. Abrams, Alias is a classic piece of sci-fi television. But it hit a major speed bump with the horribly planned twist of Not Michael Vaughn. Sidney's handler and eventual lover, Vaughn revealed in the fourth season finale that he was not actually Michael Vaughn and that he was not allied with the CIA. I don't understand, Vaughn. What are you telling me? Well, for starters, my name isn't Michael Vaughn. Unfortunately, an ill-timed and painfully contrived car crash keeps him from revealing more. What follows is a total mess of a subplot that includes a kidnapping and a fake-out death. It's like Abrams and his team wrote a twist for the sake of having a twist, not actually having any idea of where it was going or how to resolve it. Number 21, Buffy is resurrected, Buffy the Vampire Slayer. We're just gonna say it, fake out deaths are the worst, especially when they involve the main character. They're often an uninspired way to generate drama, and the oh wow, they're actually alive reveals are not usually shocking as we never buy their deaths in the first place. One of the worst offenders is Buffy the Vampire Slayer, which ends its fifth season in startlingly dramatic fashion with the death of its titular character. Don, listen to me. Listen. I love you. Her sacrifice is both emotional and meaningful, and it concludes the overarching story in a satisfying manner. Enter season six, and no way she gets resurrected. It's unoriginal, it's boring, and it ushers in a darker era of the show that many fans believe is both unnecessary and inferior. Number 20, season nine, Scrubs. The final season of Scrubs felt entirely unnecessary. By the time the show's eighth season wrapped up, it felt like everything had come to a close. Eight years of great memories. This place will live forever. But then season nine came along with a mostly new cast of characters in a new location. Only a few fan favorites were delegated to supporting or cameo roles. Although it was supposed to feel like a continuation, it essentially felt like a different show. Part of me hates how familiar this seems. I hope I can find a way to make this all feel new. Oh my god, the first day of med school, everything is so new. And to be fair, that is what show creator Bill Lawrence intended it as. But network executives meddled to keep the show under the same name. Oh, good god. While it might have found more success as a spin-off, it definitely didn't succeed as the technically final season of Scrubs. Number 19, Dan is Gossip Girl. Gossip Girl. Throughout this drama series, the titular mysterious character of Gossip Girl narrates the show while revealing embarrassing and juicy details about people. Hey Upper East Siders, Gossip Girl here, and I have the biggest news ever. In the final episode, it's revealed that Dan Humphrey, aspiring writer and love interest of Serena, was the mystery person. But this wasn't exactly a clever reveal. This is a hell of a thing you pulled off, kid. I'm in awe. Dan being Gossip Girl creates a whole host of plot holes within the show. These include occasions where Dan couldn't have posted as Gossip Girl, when he leaked compromising info about himself, or went after those close to him. You told the whole world about her losing her virginity. No, she sent that tip in herself. 
Most bafflingly, there were times when he reacted to posts he allegedly made with shock when he was alone. This one reveal made the show make less sense and left it worse off than before. Number 18. Sharing Timmy's Godparents – The Fairly Odd Parents In any long-running animated show, it can be hard to keep things fresh. Fans noted that The Fairly Odd Parents tried to change up its formula with major missteps. The introduction of side characters like Cosmo and Wanda's child Poof was the first bad sign. <laughs> Later on, they had to welcome Timmy's fairy dog. By the time the Odd Parents got a second godchild named Chloe, it was clear the show had lost its magical touch. No matter what character you think is the worst, most fans can agree that disrupting the show's central dynamic was an awful idea. Without further ado, I give you the perfect human, Chloe Carmichael! By desperately adding extraneous characters, the Fairly Odd Parents had fans wishing for the good old days. Number 17. All a Dream. Dallas. The season 8 finale of Dallas saw the death of Bobby Ewing. Throughout season 9, his loved ones and viewers mourned his passing. Thank you for coming home. Oh, I'm so sorry, honey. But everyone was more shocked when they got a shocking finale cliffhanger where Bobby's ex wife Pam discovers him in the shower. Season 10 premiere wildly reveals that the entirety of Season 9 was all just a dream Pam had. While Dallas continued afterwards, audience trust was understandably shaken when they learned an entire season of the show they were devoted to week after week didn't really happen. It's over. None of that happened. Number 16. Winning the Lottery – Roseanne Roseanne was once the number one show on television. However, during its final season, well, the first final season, the show took a drastic turn. The average Connor family won the lottery. We won the lottery! <laughs> Instead of being a down-to-earth family in relatable situations, the characters were suddenly thrust into many outlandish plotlines due to their fortune. There were dream sequences galore, celebrity guest stars, and lots of nonsense that took the show further away from its roots. Even before the finale's last second rug pull, fans agreed that Roseanne had lost its spark. I began writing about having all the money in the world, and I imagined myself going to spas and swanky New York parties, just like the people on TV, where nobody has any real problems and everything's solved within 30 minutes. The only solace was that the poorly received season officially became non-canon after the show's revival. Number 15. The Carver Reveal – Nip Tuck Nip Tuck is a great guilty pleasure show because it's not afraid to dive into absolutely ridiculous territory. Throughout some of the show's early seasons, an ongoing storyline involved The Carver. This masked criminal's assaults left his victims disfigured and often in the care of the plastic surgeons the show focused on. Although the Carver's identity was much speculated about, it ultimately was a rival plastic surgeon to protagonists Christian and Sean named Quentin Costa. It was an incredibly obvious and groan-worthy turn. And after this storyline, the show only delved into increasingly absurd storylines to one-up it. Number 14. Cousin Oliver – The Brady Bunch Everybody knows the cast of The Brady Bunch. Must somehow form a family. That's the way we all became The Brady Bunch. It's two parents who have three children each, their housekeeper and a random cousin? Well, it can be easy to forget that another cast member was added in the show's last season. The young cousin Oliver was likely added to try to hook younger audiences into caring about the series. Oliver! Hey, Oliver! Oh, hey, honey. Hi. While the show was already on the decline in ratings, many point to Oliver's awkward insertion as the final nail in the coffin for the Brady Bunch. Wish you could have stayed with some other relatives. Yeah, but I guess there's nothing we can do about it. We're stuck with them. In fact, the character was so infamous that the addition of a kid character to a show struggling with ratings is sometimes called Cousin Oliver Syndrome. Number 13. Charlie's Death – Two and a Half Men 
Charlie Sheen's exit from Two and a Half Men is the stuff of TV infamy. Following a very public rant in which he disparaged the show's creators, the actor was fired. Within the show, Sheen's character, Charlie Harper, was abruptly killed off-screen. I want to thank you all for coming. I know this is a, a very sad day for all of us. Speak for yourself. Ashton Kutcher was swiftly brought in to replace him. Even those who weren't Sheen's biggest fans had a hard time getting on board with the change. Kutcher's character completely changed the dynamic of a show that had already strayed far from its titular premise. This is Walden. <laughs> He's been by the house. <laughs> Welcome to my humble abode. Whether you thought Sheen was winning or not, most felt that Two and a Half Men definitely lost out. Number 12, Marissa Shoots Trey, The O.C. Imogen Heap's classic mm, what you say refrain became the stuff of parody because of this moment. After finding out that his older brother Trey assaulted Marissa, Ryan gets into a fight with him. <laughs> To protect Ryan, Marissa shoots Trey, leading to a dramatic cliffhanger. This twist was accompanied by an infamous musical cue. What you say? Oh, that you only meant well, well, cause you did mm, what you say. Although this moment spawned many memes, it didn't do much to keep the show fresh or deliver a boost in ratings. Many point to this scene as the moment the OC jumped the shark. Mm, what'd you say? Number 11, Michael Leaves, The Office. The Office is one of the most influential and funniest sitcoms of the 21st century so far. A big part of its success is owed to its leading man, Steve Carell. Today, I got up, I stepped onto the grill, and I clamped down on my foot. That's it. I don't see what's so hard to believe about that. As Michael Scott, Carell delivered not only peak cringe humor, but also real heart and pathos to the goofy boss. But he departed the show in season seven. While Michael's emotional goodbye was touching, the show struggled with its direction going forward. Several characters were added or promoted to try and balance things out. But without Michael leading the show, The Office just didn't leave us satisfied and smiling. <laughs> That's what she said. <laughs> Number 10, Deb Catches Dexter. Dexter. There have been plenty of points where this show about a serial killer killer has been said to have gone off the rails. While its infamous finale was criticized, the proverbial nail in Dexter's coffin came earlier. The season six finale sees Dexter's adopted sister Deborah catch him in the act of slaying the season's villain in a church. Maybe everything is exactly as it should be. While on her way there to confess her very non-sisterly feelings for him. You told me you accepted me being a killer. I feel like if you love me, you'll accept this. If I love you, if I love you, I went to the church that night that you killed Travis Marshall to tell you that I'm in love with you. Deb learning the truth was a plot point that could have had a lot of potential. However, it just put a character who'd already gone through the ringer in earlier seasons through even more trauma. This turn also damaged the one consistent relationship Dexter still had left on the show. Do what you gotta do. <sighs> Number nine, Lois and Clark's first wedding. Lois and Clark, the new adventures of Superman. Well, we're getting married in four days, and I've never been happier in my life. And every time that things are going great between us, something happens. And I just know that something bad is gonna happen to mess up our wedding. I just know it. Will they, won't they romances are tough to pull off on their own. But mixing them with superheroes is doubly difficult. Lois and Clark managed to pull this dynamic off, at least for its first few seasons. The show found increasingly ridiculous ways to stop their two leads from getting together at last. But nothing beats their first attempt at getting married. During this plot point, Lois is replaced by a frog-eating clone before we get into a further story arc that involves amnesia. How are you feeling? Fine, I guess. I'm sorry, do I know you? 
Even the campiest Silver Age comics had less silly plot threads than this. Don't be ridiculous. If I give you the gun, I can't shoot Lois. Duh. You're not going to shoot Lois. You're not going to shoot me. You're going to give me the gun. Ah! You shot me! Number 8. Connor and Cordy. Angel. While Angel's son Connor remains a polarizing figure among fans of the show, it isn't until season four that he actually helps ruin it. Let's give Cordy a little space. It's not like the world's gonna end right this second. One episode sees Connor and Cordelia, his father's on-off love interest, have sex. This starts a literal apocalyptic event. Not only does the event herald doomsday within the show, it also marks the downturn in quality from then on. And the whole thing is just really off-putting. Their weird relationship and the fallout from their affair deserved harsh judgment. While the next season does shake things up, the shine was off the apple by then. Number 7. Season 2 and Beyond – Heroes this superpowered drama had one of the most pronounced sophomore slumps in all of TV. <laughs> Initially, it told a mostly self contained story of ordinary people with superpowers coming together to save the world in season one. But season two meandered through several new and often unresolved plot points before ending abruptly due to the writer strike. The show never really recovered from the blunders made during season two and seemed to flounder for a direction. As much as we loved villains like Siler, characters definitely overstayed their welcomes past season one. I almost forgot how good this feels. When combined with elements like time travel and uneven CG, it became clear that Heroes really lost its way. Number 6. Eric Leaving, That 70s Show While this 70s-themed sitcom may have been about hanging out with a group of quirky teens and their parents, Eric Foreman was seen as the main protagonist. So when actor Topher Grace departed the show at the end of season 7, that 70s show was left without its central character. This is weird. I mean, me leaving. It's like it's real. The rest of the cast did try to forge on without him. However, the subsequent season 8 was just a mess. A ton of plot lines like Hyde's wife with an adult profession or Jackie and Fez getting together just didn't work. Stop it! You smoke first! Well, I was thinking about Tootsie Rolls! <laughs> uh, Fez, we're forcing this. By the time Eric returned for the finale, the 70s were over. I think it's time we honor all the brain cells that survived the 70s. Despite our best efforts, some of those bastards pulled. Number five. Sherlock's over and under explained return. Sherlock. It really bothers you. What? What people say. Yes. About me, I don't understand. Why would it upset you? This modern update of Sherlock Holmes started strong with engaging spins on old mysteries and great chemistry between its two leads. You'll be deciding. Deciding? Whether to come back with a warrant and arrest me. You think? Standard procedure. Should have gone with him. The series stalled for the first time due to the season two finale. In that episode, Sherlock somehow faked his death after jumping off a building. Sure. After years of fans obsessing over how he did it, the show returned with half a dozen possible versions of how it happened. What? Are you out of your mind? I don't see why not. It's just as plausible as some of your theories. Look, if you're not going to take it seriously, Laura, you can... I do take it seriously. But none of them were definitive. Many viewers saw this as the creators thumbing their noses at the fan base. Unfortunately, this kicked off a trend of increasingly incredulous twists that had fans longing for the early days of the show. But he's dead. I mean, you told me he was dead, Moriarty. Absolutely. Number 4. Cliffhanger Bait – The Walking Dead 
Depending on who you ask, there were a few points where you could say The Walking Dead started shambling downhill. But most will agree that the finale of season six was a big mistake. He broke the rules, so folks had to die. The one who fired the first shot, we strung him up to make an example of him. Could have stopped there. The finale builds towards the confrontation with the vicious Negan. After he makes a show of randomly choosing who he'll take out, he slays one of the group before it cuts to black. Oh. Oh. Look at that. Taking it like a chair. But the first person point of view made it impossible to tell who got the bat. Fans felt incredibly put off by being forced to wait for months to see who fell. You can breathe. You can blink. You can cry. You're all gonna be doing that. To add insult to injury, Glenn had already received a fake out death earlier in season six. Making death into a big stunt felt cheap. I need you to know me. Number three, the mother dies. How I Met Your Mother. I'm serious, I like this girl. So here's the deal with the deal. Robin's my new best friend, nobody bangs her. Hey, 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 she only rejected me three times. She's still very much in play. Although the entirety of the sitcom's final season raised a few eyebrows because it's mostly set over a few days, the show's last episode got them really upset. After getting to know and come to love the titular mother Tracy at last, fans got their hearts broken. We see Ted finally meet her before his ever-present narration reveals that she later died of an unspecified illness. Every sleepy Sunday afternoon, through every speed bump, every pang of jealousy or boredom or uncertainty that came our way, I carried that lesson with me. And I carried it with me when she got sick. This bad turn was then followed by a reveal that Ted still has feelings for Robin. Since the show sank a season into tracking her wedding with Barney, it also feels like her time was wasted. Ruining the entire premise of your show and character development is impressively bad. And that, kids, is how I met your mother. That's it. That's it. No, I don't buy it. That is not the reason you made us listen to this. Number two, literal cork. Lost. This complex and mystical mystery-focused show was divisive and much discussed throughout its run. You want to know a secret, Jack? Something I've known a long, long time. You're dead. But the undebatable final straw for many occurred in its finale. An earlier episode in the final season had the mysterious island's immortal protector Jacob introduce a clever metaphor. He describes the location as being like a cork, preventing evil from spreading to the rest of the world. Cork is this island. And it's the only thing keeping the darkness where it belongs. Unfortunately, it wasn't just a turn of phrase. Fans couldn't help but facepalm when the glowing source of the island's magical powers revealed in the final episode had a literal cork in it. Although we're all for striking imagery, even the show's diehard fans had to admit that this turn was a little too on the nose. Number one, King Bran, Game of Thrones. Season eight of Game of Thrones is largely agreed by most fans as being a step down from the rest of the show. It included Danny's rash decision to become a mad queen and torch King's Landing. But her crimes were nearly forgotten when Bran Stark was named as the next king of Westeros. Will you lead the Seven Kingdoms to the best of your abilities from this day until your last day? Why do you think I came all this way? He had spent a bulk of the last few seasons as mostly a passive character that delivered exposition to us and learned about the past because people told him to. And Bran's powers of foresight turned him into a mostly flat character who spouted assorted facts with tinges of emotion. Having him on the throne was a boring choice. Fans felt like they and Westeros deserved a better story than this. Between us! Between us! Between us! Did any of these moments make you stop watching?
While video games represent a realm of endless possibilities, they too have also had their share of catastrophic moments. And just like that, everything good about your game has burst into flames. Welcome to Watch Mojo, and today we're counting down our picks for the top 20 moments that ruined video games. For this list, we're looking at moments that managed to completely tarnish our gaming sessions. Don't be surprised if you experience a little deja vu. Jason! Jason! Number 20, Arson Cases, L.A. Noir. Biggs will show you the ropes, Phelps. This is arson. There are no ropes. L.A. Noir was a lot of fun for the first three quarters of it. Who wouldn't want to run around as a detective in the 40s interrogating suspects, solving murders, and getting caught in car chases? Well, all that excitement came to a grinding halt when Cole's career came crashing down and he's quickly shoved into the arson department. Hand over the gun. Keep your head down until you're bored hearing. I forbid you to make any comments to the press. It's at this point in the game where puzzles become more obtuse, as finding clues at crime scenes is like finding needles in a haystack, and the pacing of the game comes to a bewildering crawl. Honestly, we can't blame you if you stopped playing because of these cases. Everyone else is selling, but you're the holdout, aren't you? I was the last. I thought I could hold out for a better price. Number 19, Blight Town, Dark Souls. We'd happily replay a good portion of the Dark Souls series, but when it comes to the first game, our excitement levels aren't as high as they would be for the second and third games. Dark Souls built its reputation on its tough but fair difficulty. Demanding players time their moves carefully and knowing precisely when to attack, when to block, and when to dodge roll. That all goes out the window when players reach Blight Town, as this area suffers from frame rate issues, making it tricky to time your moves right. Thankfully, the problem has been fixed in the 2017 Dark Souls Remastered, six years later. Number 18, Stage 4, Parappa the Rapper. I ain't got no time for nobody. My style is rich, dope, fat, and witch. We'll make a cake today that looks rich. Parappa has always been one of those obscure PlayStation mascots that people fondly remember, but when his first game was remastered in 2017, we were reminded why many of us didn't see the game through to the end. Take out the shrimp, the clan, and the purchase. <laughs> As if the awkward timing wasn't bad enough in the first three stages, stage four made the game even more infuriating. Even though it feels like you're pressing buttons at the right time, the game will constantly throw you between the good and bad ratings. What more does this game want? Hell if we know. We stopped after hearing the song reset for the hundredth time. Number 17, Marauders and Tentacles, Doom Eternal. My eyes have been opened. Let me help you to see Slayer. While Doom Eternal has been met with mostly positive reception, there are two enemies in the game that are the frequent talk of contention. Tentacles often feel like a sucker punch and lead to a sudden end of many Ultra Nightmare runs. Marauders, on the other hand, have been lambasted for how they slow down combat, how they can only be attacked during a very specific window, and how they must be fought one-on-one -on -one in order for players to stand a chance. It's honestly no surprise that so many players are fuming because of these two, and it has sparked a discussion on removing them. Number 16, Zen, Half-Life. One cannot deny the marvel that was the first Half-Life. At the time of its release, no other shooter had accomplished the same quality of cinematics and AI. However, there are very few players out there that will defend the Zen chapters. What made these chapters so odd was how the level design required players to employ their platforming abilities, which is something you don't force upon first-person shooter players. 
It didn't help that the environment was so barren that it made Zen so unbearably uninteresting, and the healing pools slowed down pacing drastically. It's no wonder it's the most forgettable part of the game. The border world, Zen, is in our control for the time being. Number 15, Bunny Day, Animal Crossing New Horizons. <laughs> What was supposed to be the exciting start of seasonal events in New Horizons quickly became one of the most resented. All was right on our island paradise until Zipper showed up and started trashing the place with freaking eggs everywhere. Everywhere! Fishing in your river? Egg. Shaking trees? Egg. Chipping at a rock? Egg. Shoot down a balloon? Egg, 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 egg. The madness had tormented so many players that Nintendo had to reduce their spawn rate. And the worst part of it is, you didn't even need the eggs. Just get the DIY recipes and you'll get that creepy zipper toy. Our anime guru Ashley said it best on Twitter once the event was over. Is it safe to play Animal Crossing again yet? Number 14, Finding the Tribals, Jet Force Gemini. And here we have one of the rare cases of a fetch quest within a fetch quest. While the first half of the game has you shooting and exploring your way through a unique variety of alien worlds, the second half of Jet Force Gemini you have to go back and collect 12 parts of a spaceship in order to access the last level. One of these parts is locked behind another requirement, finding every tribal in the game, all 282 of them. This is a task made unbearable by the game's unreliable save system, as it only records a tally of how many tribals you collected, but doesn't specify which ones. Because of this, many players never saw the final level. Number 13, Jason. Heavy Rain. Jason. 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 Heavy Rain isn't for everyone, at least not for those looking for action-packed gameplay. However, those who were looking for an intriguing story were treated to an intense murder mystery. That isn't to say Heavy Rain was perfect, as some of its unconventional gameplay made the game the butt of many jokes, from its dancing speech commands to requiring a button prompt for literally every action. Of course, we could never forget the insanely ridiculous Jason segment. Aimlessly wander around, pressing X to Jason every second? We understand this moment is supposed to strengthen our bond with Jason, but some of us ended up turning the game off and leaving the kid lost forever. Jason! 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 Number 12, The Triforce Quest, The Legend of Zelda The Wind Waker. When a game is padding a quest out, it can feel like we're wasting our time. The Legend of Zelda has made us feel that way a couple of times, especially in Wind Waker, which has a glancing blemish on an otherwise perfect face. The Triforce quest will task you with tracking down and collecting eight Triforce shards, but before that you must obtain eight Triforce charts, which requires a lot of backtracking and they have to be deciphered by Tingle for just under 400 rupees each. Basically, this is an overcomplicated, unnecessarily long fetch quest, and it caused many players to either quit or remain as salty as the game's vast ocean for the remainder of the game. Number 11, The Tower of Blades, God of War. This wasn't just a headache, it was a nightmarish migraine. In the first God of War, Kratos must escape Hades by scaling a massive pillar of spinning blades. Sounds simple, until you get hit and fall all the way back down to the bottom. This caused many players to give up and never play it again. Although this problem did not go unnoticed by the developers. In an interview with Games TM, director David Jaffe admitted that this segment was not tested and focus testing was skipped because they thought everything was fine with it. This was something he regrets doing. Well, at least he's honest about it. Number 10, 
Number 10, the whole volcano sequence, Resident Evil 5. One of the most polarizing games in the franchise, Resident Evil 5 made some drastic changes to the series' formula by making co-op gameplay its main focus. Resident Evil has been known to feature some of the most ridiculous moments in gaming, but none has been quite as absurd as this. As the final level in the game, we witnessed Albert Wesker turn into a tentacled garbage monster, and we were subjected to quite possibly the most insane quick-time event of all time, Chris Redfield punching a boulder. We honestly don't know what was ruined more, our thumbs or this game. Yeah. Number 9. The Impossible Levels – The Lion King If you somehow managed to conquer The Lion King's convoluted monkey puzzle, then you got the unfortunate experience of playing one of the most difficult platformers ever made. Chances are you eventually became so frustrated that a controller was thrown or you uttered your very first obscenity before officially quitting. What if we told you there was a reason for the game's unforgiving difficulty? According to Lewis Castle, co-founder of developer Westwood Studios, Disney believed that if players managed to beat the game, they would not buy it. That's a fair point, but this was a game designed for kids, so challenging wasn't a friendly term to younger players. At least Aladdin was easier, more or less. Number 8. Smashing a gate with demon babies. Ghostbusters, the video game. A few concussive hits and the hinges might just break loose. When you force players to use a mechanic that works half the time, maybe don't make it the primary focus of a puzzle. That's exactly what Ghostbusters did in its final level. To get the Ecto-1 through the cemetery, you have to slime tether flying demon babies to smash open a gate. The problem is that not only is this the only way to defeat this particular enemy, but the slime tether doesn't always function properly. Most of the time, it'll smash the nuisances into other things or fail entirely and do nothing. Even on the easiest difficulty, the harassment you'll endure from the demon babies is enough to make anyone quit, especially since you'll encounter them again shortly after. Number 7. Batmobile Sections – Batman Arkham Knight Just a matter of time before I find you, Dark Knight. We've lost the Cobra. Maintaining search pattern. For years, fans had been itching to take the Batmobile out for a spin in the Batman Arkham games. Well, developer Rocksteady made it happen for the final chapter in the series. And it was certainly not what everyone was hoping for. Many players felt glued to the Batmobile because of some missions requiring the player to race a time limit or blow up enemy tanks. Don't worry though, the Batmobile's cannons are non-lethal. How even? That makes no sense, it's a freaking tank! Arkham Knight was not a terrible game, unless you played the PC version. But to many Dark Knight fans, this would be one whimper of a finale. Five. Four. Three. Two. One. Let's finish this. Number 6. The Speeder Bike Levels – Battletoads Battletoads might be one of the most difficult platformers in gaming, but there are a few portions that are somewhat doable. What isn't doable are the speeder bike levels, which will lull you into a sense of easy patterns before demanding faster and faster reactions. Needless to say, this is not a game for the easily frustrated, as you'll find yourself swearing at your screen and going into a blind rage. Honestly, we'll never know how some people have managed to beat the game. Then again, we'll never even attempt it because the cycle of fury will just begin anew. It's best for both us and our masochistic love for Battletoads. Number 5. Iden Versio's Complete 180 – Star Wars Battlefront 2 Eliminate the Rebels and return to the Corvus. The Emperor's plan must not fail. Yes, sir. Agent Hask with me. Agent Miko, cover us from here. Prior to launch, DICE and Electronic Arts touted the single-player campaign as an opportunity to play as the bad guy, a chance to see the perspective from the Empire as they take down those rebel scum. Seems like they were ready to show something interesting in the first half. 
I did not call for you, Commander Versia. Vardos is our target? One of them, yes. Why? The entire planet and its people, they're, they're loyal to the Empire. However, the entire campaign falls apart when Aiden suddenly defects to the Rebels because you destroyed my home planet, I hate you, Dad. In short, it was less of a seeing through the eyes of a stormtrooper and more of a cop-out to tell a story that heavily borrows motives and cues from other Star Wars stories. Oh, and she falls in love with Del, as if the story couldn't get any more tropey. You really think I'm gonna let you just float out here alone? Del. We're Infernal Squad. You and me. Number four, The Animus, the Assassin's Creed series. Great, that should do it. We'll email you the receipt. Till next time, take care, Sean. Bye-bye, yes, bye. And don't expect any more free coffee. To newcomers, Assassin's Creed seems like a series of grand adventures that take place throughout different time periods. This belief is not entirely wrong, but it's also why many new players have left disappointed. For example, Black Flag boasts an excellent experience and is regarded as the best in the series. However, when the animus is ham-fisted into the plot, it feels like you just took on a second job. This completely destroys the immersion, and it's enough to cause any new players to delete the game from their system. Can you really blame them? Speaking of which, our trailer is finished. Would you like to see it? I owe you that much. Number three, Big's campaign, Sonic Adventure. Froggy? Uh-oh. Many fans fondly remember Sonic Adventure for its open exploration and quality graphics. Well, at the time they were. Is it the best Sonic game ever? Well, it could have been had it not been for Big the Cat. Only a terrible character like him could deliver such an abysmal experience. In case you were never subjected to it, Big's campaign involves fishing for his pet Froggy in various levels. Yes, it's incredibly tedious, and the poor controls certainly didn't make the experience any more tolerable. Needless to say, many of us put the controller down to go question our life choices and the purpose of searching for this damn frog. Number two, the world is just a video game. Star Ocean, till the end of time. Imagine clocking so many hours into an RPG and when the story's reaching its climax, you witness a plot twist that completely decimates your hard work. Star Ocean did exactly that until the end of time. About two thirds of the way into the game, everyone in this space exploring adventure ends up in a parallel universe, where they learn that their universe is all just an MMORPG. The Eternal Sphere is a universe inside a simulator. Earth is one of the planets inside that universe. More surprisingly, they handle this reality-shattering truth surprisingly well. This revelation doesn't just dampen the adventure, it also undermines all of the events of previous Star Ocean titles. And since then, the franchise hasn't been able to achieve its once notable reputation. We're just characters living inside a simulator? That's right. Before we unveil our number one pick, here are some dishonorable mentions. <laughs> Humanity's imprisonment is a kindness. Number one, the ending, Mass Effect 3. Because of you, humanity is already undone. That's not true! They have the Citadel! They've got us fighting each other instead of fighting them! I just need to... You've done exactly what the Reapers wanted! You're still doing it because they control you! Look, ending a video game on a high note can be hard. We get it. As for Mass Effect 3, whew, that backlash was intense. When it launched, critics and fans praised Mass Effect 3 for its combat, music, voice acting, just about everything was as perfect as Mama's cooking. Except the ending. The ending was a complete mess, as both fans and critics pointed out contradictions and inconsistencies in the narrative, 
expressing their disappointment and frustration. How could BioWare end the series on such a sour note? This prompted BioWare to release free DLC known as the Extended Cut, which added more to the story while resolving a few problems. Okay, let's face it, it can't be easy being a comedian. Comedy is subjective after all. But these next comedians, well, they ruined everything overnight. This was my statement from the very beginning and it will continue to be forever because it is the truth. Welcome to Watch Mojo, and today we're counting down our picks for the top 10 times comedians destroyed their careers overnight. Why did I do this? Well, I think everything in, in life and in Hollywood and art and comedy as you try when we tried for this list we'll be looking at times where one act or a revelation about a comedic professional tarnished their reputations although some of these comedians may have continued to get work or find success we'll count those who faced public backlash or consequences for their choices which scandal do you think was the most shocking number 10 steven ronazisi's big lie you know after 2009 I would never go on, anytime I was ever asked it, I always sidestepped it. I said I was downtown and it was an awful day in New York. In the aftermath of September 11th, 2001, many harrowing stories came out about where people were on that day. But the one from the League star, Steven Ranazizi, wasn't true. This story's hard to follow. Early in his comedy career, Ranazizi claimed he was working in the South Tower when the attack occurred. He allegedly got out of the building before it fell. Surviving the attack convinced Ranazizi to pursue his dream of being a comedian. It was as simple as sitting at the comedy store and everyone was like, hey, you're from New York? Yeah, yeah. You, you, were you just there? You were nine. You were around? Yeah, yeah. I was downtown. Yeah, I was there. You worked there? Yeah, I, yeah, I did. After he repeated and upheld the story for years, the New York Times exposed his lie in 2015. Although Ranazizi apologized, his career never really recovered. He went from starring on a successful TV show for seven years to being mostly relegated to guest spots and podcast appearances. Number nine, Shane Gillis's racist comments. And it was funny, too, because people were like, man, they really had to dig to find this. I was like, man, it's probably like three minutes in. <laughs> it was like we had one podcast online, and it was three minutes in. Some comedians consider getting cast on Saturday Night Live officially making it in the biz. Before Gillis could truly celebrate that milestone, a deep dive into his background revealed some unsavory comments from Matt and Shane's secret podcast. On a 2018 episode, Gillis can be heard using racial and homophobic slurs. The outrage caused Lauren Michaels to fire the comedian only four days after being hired in 2019. Gillis would go on to issue an apology and continue to work. Like as big as racism is in America, football. <laughs> Over the next few years, he found success with comedy specials and even appeared in a series centered around SNL star Pete Davidson in 2023. His podcast comments ultimately seemed to stall his TV prospects for a few years. Also, you're, my, you're in my profile picture, so that's, that's helping quite a bit. I DM'd Chris Evans. Dude, he, I told him I was with you guys and he was like, cool. Number eight. Gilbert Gottfried's insensitive tweets. Oh, now, Gilbert, <laughs> you're gonna get into trouble again. We all knew him as the comedian with the loud voice. So while we laughed at lots of the things Gilbert said, a few of his tweets drew frowns. The most tragic thing about the fall of Rome is the series that HBO is gonna make out of it. Too soon. In the wake of the 2011 earthquake and tsunami that devastated parts of Japan, Gottfried posted a series of 12 tweets making light of the disaster. Many considered these jokes in poor taste, especially the insurance company Aflac. They quickly moved to drop Gilbert as the voice of their duck mascot. Despite the setback, his career in movies and TV continued to thrive. However, Gottfried didn't pick up too many more commercial campaigns after he issued his tweets. The Aflac duck? Yes. Did you lose a lot of money? Ah, uh, no, In future, no. It, was, it was five dollars a commercial. <laughs> Number seven, Charles Rocket gets fired. It's okay, he's just asleep. So apparently there's no danger now, but there could be soon. Something you have to think about every time you visit Central Park. 
While Saturday Night Live heavily discourages hard cursing, the show has seen its fair share of accidental profanity over the years. One of the most infamous examples came from Charles Rocket. Hired for SNL during the 1980-1981 season, Rocket was billed as the replacement for original cast members Bill Murray and Chevy Chase. He even had his own segment called The Rocket Report. But it all came crashing down in the final moments of an episode after Rocket used a certain four-letter F word. Charlie, how are you feeling after you've been shot? Oh man, it's the first time I've ever been shot in my life. I'd like to know who <laughs> a combination of his profanity and dissatisfaction with his overall performance that season led to his dismissal. It took Rocket a couple of years and a few smaller roles before he began getting steady work once more. What is this? What is this? Where's all the money? That's as good as money, sir. Those are IOUs. Number six, Jamie Kennedy's disastrous hosting gig. I'm with my two lovely ladies, girls. What's your resolution for 2013? I'm to um, just get rid of all my haters. All your haters. You might know him from the Scream franchise or his self-titled prank show entitled The Jamie Kennedy Experiment. If you didn't know that he hosted a 2013 holiday show, we wouldn't blame you. Dubbed the worst New Year's Eve special ever by some reporters, the show was plagued with technical issues. Where's our, where's our stage manager? Don't the Kennedy made the situation worse with unfunny jokes, a random format, and a few offensive moments. As the cherry on top of this mess, he missed the actual countdown in New Year's. He later said that the surreal tone of the show was intentional. But no matter what Kennedy's true intentions were, he hasn't starred in too many high-profile roles since 2013. People try to recreate this. You can't. It was beautiful. It was lightning in an artistic league trained... Um, Bottle. Number five, Paul Rubens arrested. I made a dog collar out of macaroni for Aloysius. <laughs> There's all sorts of cool junk you can make out of macaroni. Starring in 80s kids' favorites like Pee Wee's Playhouse and Pee Wee's Big Adventure, Paul Rubens' iconic, quirky character rocketed him to superstardom. After playing Pee Wee for almost a decade, Rubens decided to take a break from the character in 1991. Supposed to mean. Supposed to mean. <laughs> I think everyone here knows what this is supposed to mean. That was the same year he was arrested in an adult movie theater for indecent exposure. Pee Wee toys were pulled from store shelves and reruns of his show were canceled. While he kept working for the next decade, a return to the role didn't seem likely. But Rubens did eventually reprise the role of Pee Wee Herman for wide audiences in a well-received Netflix special 15 years after his arrest. Ladies, it's been real and it's been fun. And it's been real fun. Number four, Kathy Griffin's presidential photo. I wanted to shame him. I wanted to shame him. He's such a misogynist and his policies are so disgusting. And for the rights of women and LGBT folks and people of color, I was like, this guy's going down. Plenty of comedians made digs at Donald Trump before, during, and after his presidency. However, Kathy Griffin stood out with a particular image. The comedian infamously posed for a graphic photo where it appeared as if she was holding the then president's head. Venues canceled her tour dates and she lost her yearly spot on CNN's live New Year's Eve broadcast. Additionally, Griffin was also investigated by government officials. It is all over Twitter, but it's coming directly from the President of the United States to a 56-year-old female comedian who has no studio backing her, no network backing her. I don't have a big franchise movie coming out. He picked me. Don't you get it? After the initial controversy, she launched her Laugh Your Head Off comedy tour to take a jab at herself and the photo. She played some sold-out shows and even released a comedy special in 2019. In 2020, Griffin even brought the photo back. I think they knew I was like an easy mark, right? So just so you know, out of all the dudes who supposedly threatened the president, none of them got in this kind of trouble, all right? He's not going to go after Snoop Dogg or the singer Morrissey. Number three, Louis C.K. admits to misdeeds. Why am I trying to impress you? Why don't you tell me about your goddamn life and try to impress me? Why, why aren't you nervous to be with me? At the height of his comedy career, Louis was starring on a successful TV show and awaiting the release of a film he wrote and directed. Everything was put on hold when a report by the New York Times included accounts from women accusing Louis of sexual misconduct. After the article came out, Louis, Network FX, announced they would cease working with the comedian. Does that, does that mean nothing to you? You almost got everybody hurt. The theater release of the comedian's I Love You Daddy movie was also canceled. Less than a year later, CK began performing in comedy clubs and releasing stand-up specials on his website. He also won a Grammy for Best Comedy Album in 2022. It's still unclear whether CK will be cast in more mainstream TV and movie projects again. Anybody else get in global amounts of trouble? Anybody else? <laughs> <laughs> Number two, Roseanne Barr loses her show. I'm trying to talk about Iran. I'm trying to talk about Valerie Jarrett wrote the Iran deal. I know, 
Yeah, but you've told me this 300 times. Although Roseanne has not been a stranger to controversy, one particular tweet heavily derailed her career. In 2018, Barr compared Valerie Jarrett, one of Barack Obama's senior aides, to an ape on Twitter. Many people did not take kindly to Barr's remarks. And shortly after the tweet went viral, ABC canceled the revival. Well, your mom's creative, so I get that. But here's the thing. You've got to pick your fights in life. The network followed that by replacing the show with The Connors, which noticeably didn't include Barr. In the years following the incident, Barr was largely absent from television and movies. Outside of a comedy special on Fox Nation, there were few indications that the comedian will be invited onto new projects as of May 2023. Anyways, anybody else been fired recently? <laughs> Number one, Michael Richards' racist tirade. For this to happen, for me to be in a comedy club and flip out and say this crap, you know, I'm, I'm deeply, deeply sorry. After his nine-year stint as the beloved Kramer on Seinfeld, Richards decided to go back to his stand-up roots. In 2006, he was performing at the Laugh Factory when his set was interrupted by hecklers. Richards responded by going on a racist tirade against the audience members. The entire incident was all captured on video and was widely covered by media outlets. Oh, I guess you got me there. You're absolutely right. I'm just a washer. While Richards apologized for his behavior, his words weren't enough to get him back to his former heights. He retired from stand-up and picked up less than 10 T TV and film credits over the next 15 years. The racist tirade continues to cast a shadow over his career and legacy. Hey, hold the foot! <laughs> Many celebrity careers have taken unexpected turns, but as we're about to find out, sometimes it takes just one interview question to destroy everything. How did those injuries come about? I, I wish to God I knew. Welcome to Watch Mojo. And today we're looking at times celebrities severely damaged their reputations by answering just one single interview question. Number 10, describe your character's motivations. Liam Neeson. But what I do have are a very particular set of skills. Skills I've acquired over a very long career. With a steady batch of movies released each year, Liam Neeson has done a lot of press over his lifetime, but a routine junket interview with The Independent for his 2019 revenge film, Cold Pursuit, embroiled the Oscar nominee in scandal. With the questioning landing on how his latest character turns to anger, the actor shared a real-life experience of revenge-seeking after learning that a friend was sexually assaulted. The actor admits that at one point in his life, he wanted to kill a random black man. With the friend identifying her unknown attacker as black, Neeson says he wandered through the neighborhoods hoping a black man would come out of a pub and, quote, have a go so he could, quote, kill him. I'm ashamed to say that. And I did it for maybe a week. Even though Neeson iterated that he regretted those actions, he still had plenty of damage control to do afterwards. No, I'm, I'm not racist. I, 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 this was nearly 40 years ago, but because I was brought up, and maybe I'm rabbiting on, Rob, so forgive mm -hmm. me. I was brought up in the north of Ireland and, and brought up in the Troubles. Number nine, did you ever take banned substances? Lance Armstrong. Prior to 2013, cyclist Lance Armstrong was an inspiration to millions worldwide. After all, he had won the Tour de France a whopping seven years in a row, not to mention the abundance of charitable work he did. For seven straight years, he dominated arguably the hardest sporting event in the world. History in the making, seven times a winner of the Tour de France. Around him grew an empire that included a powerful foundation dedicated to fighting cancer. So what happened after 2013? Well, that's when Armstrong sat down with Oprah Winfrey for a jaw-dropping interview slash confession. In your opinion, was it humanly possible to win the Tour de France without doping? Seven times in a row. Not in my opinion. He had already been stripped of his titles amid doping allegations, but the interview confirmed that the rumors were indeed facts. Lance Armstrong has no place in cycling. Oprah asked point blank if he ever took banned substances to enhance his cycling performance, and Armstrong responded, yes. And just like that, his legacy was forever altered, for the worse. Yes or no, did you ever take banned substances to enhance your cycling performance? Yes. Number eight, is there any truth to the allegations? Woody Allen. 
When Woody Allen appeared on 60 Minutes in 1992 to discuss his falling out with former partner Mia Farrow, things got fairly awkward. I went up and played with the kids, read them stories, did, did my usual things. We played out on the lawn and, and um, you know, had a wonderful time with them. And out of this has grown lawyers and psychologists. When asked about the accusations that he abused the daughter he adopted with Pharaoh, Dylan, many expected Allen to offer a straightforward denial. However, the actor and director opted to answer with a baffling diatribe instead. I had many opportunities in the past. I could have quietly made a, a, a custody settlement with Mia in some way and done it in the future. I mean, you know, it's so insane. He said it would be, quote, illogical for him to do such a thing at the time and went on to list a bunch of reasons why. He also insinuated that Pharaoh was the mastermind, plotting revenge against him. Either she has been coached methodically to, to um, tell the story because... By Mia. By Mia, yeah. It's three decades later and people still scratch their heads at how Alan chose to profess his innocence. Number seven, did you enjoy your film, Katherine Heigl? Katherine Heigl's fall from Hollywood's good graces can be traced back to a 2008 interview with Vanity Fair. After winning an Emmy for her role on Grey's Anatomy and having starred in the smash hit blockbuster Knocked Up, Heigl certainly had a lot to be happy about. We're just doing what we can. We're making the best of it, and I don't want us to put any more pressure on ourselves. But when the actress was asked about the Judd Apatow film she made alongside Seth Rogen, she did not hold back in her true feelings. What? What? I'm pregnant. With emotion? With a baby. You're the father. Catherine said she was not happy with Knocked Up and called it, quote, a little sexist. She went on to say, quote, it paints women as shrews, as humorless and uptight, while it paints the men as, quote, lovable, goofy, fun-loving guys. Exactly. We can work together. This can help us if anything, I think. Her comments were met with immediate criticism and have followed her for years, despite recent Mia culpas. I'm gonna be really honest right now, I'm not. I know I'm not. Yeah. I don't have to think about it. I'm not a rude person. I'm not an unkind or mean person. Number six, what are your thoughts on psychiatry? Tom Cruise. Tom Cruise has weathered more than a few controversies over the years. But in the mid-2000s, things were at a critical mass. You know how you handle an actor? They whine about anything. You pull down their pants and you spank their ass. It all went down during a whirlwind time when the actor started dating actress Katie Holmes. Cruz had already jumped on Oprah's couch Ever felt this way? <laughs> and shared statements on Brooke Shields' postpartum depression when he sat down with Matt Lauer on NBC's Today Show. I'm just living my life. And, and I'm doing the best that I can and doing it in a way that I feel is, is right. Things turned intense when Lauer asked about Cruz's stance on psychiatry and Shields' endorsement of antidepressants. Tom called psychiatry a, quote, pseudoscience and began to debate Lauer on depression treatments, notably Ritalin. And I know that uh, psychiatry is it's a pseudoscience. It was a moment that forever changed people's opinion of the movie star. Matt, Matt, you, you don't even, you're glib. You don't even know what Ritalin is. Number five, how did she get those injuries? Jonathan Majors. Jonathan Majors experienced the highest of highs and the lowest of lows in 2023. What's coming? Me. A lot of me. He was riding the wave of stardom as Kang the Conqueror in the MCU and with starring roles in films like Creed III. Will this be a fairy tale or a massacre? Things came crashing down, however, when he was arrested and later found guilty of assaulting and harassing his ex-girlfriend. In an interview for Good Morning America, Majors opened up and attempted to save face by denying everything. When asked how his ex received her injuries, the actor said, I, I wish to God I knew. That would give clarity. That would give me some type of peace about it. He then went on to say that he was, quote, reckless with her heart, but not her body. But never hit a woman. Never hit a woman. I've never, my hands have never struck a woman. The response did little to reassure the public of his innocence, only raising further questions. The peace between realities. <laughs> Number four, what are you trying to do with the message you're sending? Kanye West. 
Where to even start with Kanye? The prolific rapper has said and done numerous controversial things on a vast array of platforms. I don't follow like rules of like, you know, normal celebrity or what their publicist tells them to say or anything. But it was through one simple question on TMZ Live in 2018 that sent Kanye straight down a rabbit hole of scandal. After being seen with a Make America Great Again hat on, host Harvey Levin asked Kanye about the message he wanted to send. What are you trying to do with the message you're sending? Well, it was really just my subconscious. It was a feeling I had. Kanye being Kanye went on a rant about free thought. He then caused a huge stir when he spoke about slavery, saying that to him, it sounded, quote, like a choice. When you hear about slavery for 400 years, for 400 years, that sounds like a choice. <laughs> like, you was there for 400 years and it's all of y'all? Of course, Kanye would go on to say even more shocking things in the years that followed. And if we're being honest, we'll likely continue to do so in the years to come. So you're gonna love me, or you're gonna hate me, but I'm gonna be me. Number three, do you see why people worry about you sharing a bed with Michael Jackson? Late pop star Michael Jackson has long been accused of inappropriate and illegal acts involving minors. In 1993, Jordan Chandler, a teenage cancer patient, sued Jackson for sexual abuse, leading to a criminal investigation. During an infamous interview with journalist Martin Bashir as part of the documentary Living with Michael Jackson, the star was asked if he understood why people would be worried about him sharing his bed with Chandler. He talked about the fact that he shares your bedroom. Yes. Can you understand why people would worry about that? Because they're ignorant. The response was nothing short of shocking, as Jackson defended the practice by calling it, quote, a beautiful thing. Why should it be worrying? Who's the criminal? Who's, who's Jack the Ripper in the room? <laughs> this is a guy trying to help heal a child. He also said that he has slept in a bed with many youths and called it, quote, very right and, quote, loving. Kiri, Kieran Culkin would sleep on this side, Macaulay Cook is on this side, his sister's in there, we're all just jamming the bit. While Jackson saw the act as, quote, helping the boy heal, others saw it as proof of the crimes he was being accused of. Number two, your response to the allegations, Prince Andrew. It's the interview equivalent of car crash. Amidst the media scrutiny surrounding Jeffrey Epstein's inner circle, Prince Andrew sat down with BBC's Emily Maitlis in an effort to clear his name. But today, you've chosen to speak out for the first time. Why have you decided to talk now? When Maitlis asked the prince for his response to allegations made by an accuser of his, Virginia Roberts, he boldly and straight up denied ever meeting her. I have no recollection of ever meeting this lady. None whatsoever. This despite photographic evidence that shows he did. Andrew says the photo is not valid. He also went on to say that he didn't regret his friendship with Epstein, adding that it presented him with, quote, useful opportunities. He has quite obviously conducted himself in a manner unbecoming, yes. Unbecoming, he was a sex offender. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm being polite. It was clear that the interview did not help his case, and the prince stepped down from public duties for the royal family shortly after. Number one, do you like teenage girls? R. Kelly. It's hard to imagine given all that we know today, but in the 2000s, singer R. Kelly had many defenders. What were they defending him against? Why, those would be a long list of sexual misconduct allegations. I'm very tired of all of the uh, lies. I've been hearing things and, you know, and seeing things on the blogs and, you know, I'm just, I'm just tired. In 2002, Kelly was indicted, but would go on to be acquitted in 2008. That's the year he took part in an interview with BET's Torre about the damning claims. When asked about whether he liked teenage girls, Kelly's response was a jaw dropper. When you say teenage, how are we talking? Girls who are teenagers. It was an infamous response at the time, and it's easy to see why. Kelly added another notorious interview moment to his name when he sat down with Gail King in 2019 and became unhinged. I didn't do this stuff. This is not me, y'all. I'm fighting for my life. The musician is now serving 20 years in jail for his various crimes. Which interview response shocked you the most? That's a beautiful thing. That's, that's not a worrying thing. 
If you thought news reporters were pretty safe from ruining their jobs on TV, you'd be wrong. Very, very wrong. And I want to begin with two words. I'm sorry. Welcome to Watch Mojo. And today we're counting down our picks for when news reporters, journalists, and TV anchors seriously impacted their careers for whatever reasons. Another case of open mouth, insert foot, lose job. Number 10, Brian Williams. I want to apologize. I said I was traveling in an aircraft that was hit by RPG fire. I was instead in a following aircraft. Brian Williams was a high profile managing editor and anchor for NBC Nightly News. But in 2015, his rep took a big hit due to allegations concerning his coverage of the 2003 invasion of Iraq. At first, Williams claimed he had been in a helicopter in Iraq that had to land after another chopper was nearly struck by an RPG. When the helicopter we were traveling in was forced down after being hit by an RPG. Our traveling NBC News team was rescued, surrounded, and kept alive by an armored mechanized platoon from the U.S. Army 3rd Infantry. Over the years, his story changed to his aircraft needing to land after being hit. Soldiers who were there at the time contested the newer versions of Williams' story. While the anchor eventually apologized for exaggeration, the damage was done, and he was suspended and eventually moved to a lesser position. After 28 years of Peacock logos on much of what I own, it is my choice now to jump without a net into the great unknown. Number nine. Ivory Hecker. Before we get to that story, I want to let you, the viewers, know that Fox Corp has been muzzling me to keep certain information from you, the viewers. It's not often a reporter purposely tanks their career live on TV, but in 2021, that's what Ivory Hecker did on the local news affiliate Fox 26 Houston. On the air, Hecker launched into a rant that Fox had been what she called muzzling her and other reporters about topics she wanted to cover. From what I'm gathering, I am not the only reporter being to, subjected to this. I am going to be releasing some recordings about what goes on behind the scenes at Fox. She stated she would release secret recordings made with the right-wing activist group Project Veritas. These revolved around promoting the disproven hydroxychloroquine as a COVID-19 treatment. After being initially suspended for her on-air outburst, unsurprisingly, Hecker was fired. I found a nonprofit journalism group called Project Veritas. It's going to put that out tomorrow, so tune into them. Number eight, Ken Rosado. All right, Heather, thank you. 541, still ahead on Eyewitness News this morning. New guidelines issued for New York educators. Having joined New York's WABC TV in 2003 as a reporter, the Emmy Award winning Ken Rosado eventually became the channel's anchor for Eyewitness News this morning. Yet, after decades in the business, in 2023, Rosado found himself in hot water. Reportedly, he was heard calling co-host Shirlene Alicott an insult on an open microphone. While the show was off air and the audio wasn't broadcast to the viewing audience, it was heard by production staff in the studio. There were allegations the comment was offensive. No matter the racism and the prejudice that I experienced, because I experienced it. However, Rosado's representatives denied this to be the case. Regardless, WABC-TV moved quickly and fired the anchor. Heather? Yes. What we, do you have for us? Oh, yeah. We're not looking too good. Number seven, Aaron Calvin. Abandoned by the register. That's what former Des Moines Register reporter Aaron Calvin told BuzzFeed that he feels like after being fired from the paper earlier this week. It started with a man named Carson King in the background of ESPN's college game day coverage, holding a jokey sign with his Venmo stating he needed beer money. After a big response, King started raising money for the University of Iowa Stead Family Children's Hospital and finished his campaign with millions in donations. During the fame, reporter Aaron Calvin did a profile on King for the Des Moines Register, in which he mentioned the fundraiser's problematic social media account from years before when he was a teen. But then it started to fall apart. A reporter at the Des Moines Register found insensitive tweets King wrote eight years ago when he was 16, reportedly based off a Comedy Central show, Tosh.0. Oh, remember that show? After making the post and King's apology, Calvin was harassed, had his life threatened, and his own potentially problematic tweets parsed. Eventually, the Des Moines Register fired Calvin. The latest twist, that reporter had his own old insensitive tweets and now has been fired. No. Yes. Oh Number six, Lydia Cumming. It's a photo that seems to show ordinary people lending a hand to a flood victim. Or does it? It's usually not great when a reporter becomes a viral meme. 
But that's what happened to reporter Lydia Cumming in 2016 as she covered a flood in Puebla, Mexico for TV Azteca. Taken by a photographer at the scene, Cumming was hoisted up in the air by two locals, seemingly to avoid her shoes getting wet. Lydia Cumming is a 24-year-old reporter who hitched a ride with this couple while reporting on devastating floods in Mexico. After the image got out, she was photoshopped into all sorts of situations. However, TV Azteca was less than impressed with the social media fame. They fired Cumming for disrespectfully using local residents in a trying time. Why doesn't she take off her shoes instead? Another post, you would think that wearing maybe rain boots in a flooded area would be common sense. In an interview afterward, Cumming claimed the residents wanted to show her their elderly disabled neighbor and offered to carry her, which she briefly agreed to. Number five, Rick Sanchez. I don't mind Sanchez at all until today where he really stepped in it. After joining CNN in 2004 as a reporter, Rick Sanchez quickly rose up the ranks as a news anchor, even getting his own program with Rick's List. But in 2010, that vanished when he appeared on Sirius XM's radio program, Stand Up with Pete Dominic. Pete has actually worked for John Stewart in the past, so he's defending Stewart, obviously, throughout. Angered by reports about his show's time slot being replaced and with Jon Stewart for comedic jabs at him, Sanchez called Stewart a bigot. Sanchez then claimed CNN and other networks discriminated against him and made comments about Stewart's ethnic background and the news business. Very unsurprisingly, Sanchez was soon fired by CNN and later joined Fox. You were the host of that show on a competing network, by the way, and you kind of introduced me into this whole thing. So And look what happened from wasn't... there. Number four, Marley Rivera. Oh, I'm sorry, I don't know you speak English now. I'm sorry, you speak English. I'm sorry. As a reporter for ESPN and the Spanish language channel ESPN Deportes, Marley Rivera was one of the biggest names in sports journalism. After all, she was included in the Sports Illustrated article, The 30 Most Influential Hispanics in Sports in 2017. But in 2023, that reputation took a hit. Before a New York Yankees game, freelancer Yvonne Gaetti tried to interview Aaron Judge, but Rivera argued with Gaetti that she had already scheduled an interview with the MLB star. The face-off was recorded, which included Rivera using an expletive while insulting Gaetti. Yeah, but did you record it, right? I wasn't talking about you. To make it worse for Rivera, Gaetti is married to the MLB Vice President of Communications, John Blundell. While Rivera apologized, Gaetti reportedly rejected it, and Rivera was soon fired by ESPN. Rivera would admit she and her fellow reporter have had disagreements in the past. Number three. Chris Cuomo. You know the biggest media story this weekend. It's the firing of Chris Cuomo from this network, CNN. Prominent anchor and journalist Chris Cuomo joined CNN in 2013 and eventually got his own program, Cuomo Primetime. And with his brother, Andrew Cuomo, being the governor of New York, he had some pretty good connections. Well, that was until multiple misconduct allegations came out about the governor. And a former female colleague has now come forward accusing Chris Cuomo of sexual misconduct. He denies any wrongdoing. While Cuomo publicly stated he couldn't talk about the story due to his close connection, reportedly behind the scenes, the anchor and licensed attorney advised his brother on dealing with the scandal and used his sources to gather information on the accusers. After being briefly suspended by CNN during an investigation, Cuomo was let go by the network in 2021. A CNN spokesperson saying overnight, when the new allegation came to us this week, quote, we took, it, we took them seriously and saw no reason to delay taking immediate action. Number two, Megyn Kelly. It seemed okay. Well, I was wrong and I am sorry. After leaving Fox, Megyn Kelly became one of the highest paid anchors when she joined NBC in 2017. And one of her main tasks was hosting her own talk show, Megyn Kelly Today. Yet in 2018, one segment in particular caused a massive scandal for Kelly. As the panel discussed the topic of offensive blackface, Kelly stated when she was a child, that was okay as long as people were playing a character. She then defended the actions of Luann De La Seps, who was criticized when cosplaying as Diana Ross. And people said that that was racist. And I don't know, I felt like... Who doesn't love Diana Ross? She wants to look like Diana Ross for one day. I, I don't know how like that got racist on Halloween. Days later, Kelly's show was canceled. 
In early 2019, she was dropped by NBC, but also received the remaining $30 million from her contract. Parties have resolved their differences, and Megyn Kelly is no longer an employee of NBC. Number one. Matt Lauer. Lauer was scheduled to host the Rockefeller Center tree lighting. As you guys know, he was not there last night. After joining NBC in 1992, Matt Lauer would become one of the network's most recognizable and marketable faces. On top of being an anchor for the Today Show, Matt Lauer also hosted the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade and the Olympic Games opening ceremonies. Then in 2017, NBC received a detailed report from a female colleague accusing Lauer of harassment that began during the coverage of the 2014 Winter Olympics in Russia. NBC News can report two additional women came forward to the network after the news initially broke. After an investigation by the networks, they fired the host from his hosting and reporting duties. And not long after, further allegations came out about Lauer during his time at NBC. And we were told some very shocking and disturbing stories, which are a stark contrast to the Matt Lauer that everybody has known for over 20 years. What reporter or host do you think impacted their career the most? Stop NBC it. News fired Lauer roughly 24 hours after an employee made a complaint against the anchor. All right, well, that's going to do it for this look at all the exact moments that ruined it all. I've been Matt from Watch Mojo. And I'll see you next time.